Yep. Good morning. Please join us in our welcoming song. Unitarian Universalist Congregation. We are a community. We are a community of diverse beliefs, and united by our desire to grow in love and in service. Whoever you are, whomever you love, you are welcome here. Whether we you gather with us every Sunday, only occasionally, or especially if this is your first time, we are really pleased that you're here and. And I'm Alice Dodd, your worship associate today. Uh, the service is led by our minister, Reverend Sharon Wiley. Our worship musician is Tim McKnight. And our song leader is Laura Brown. Our tech team is Hope Campbell and Sarah Komnick. And our greeter is Ron Petzels. Uh, now, Reverend Sharon, Laura Brown, and I have passed our COVID test. And Tom Carlstrom, yes. Uh, so, so we're performing without performing. We're talking to you <clears throat> without masks. Welcome to our Sunday worship service, uh, both here in this room and online on Zoom. In the chapel, you'll notice we have the windows open. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, but this improves the air circulation, and, uh, and there are also four um, air purifiers in the room. Uh, so, but if you're uncomfortable for any reason and you want to sit outside, uh, step out on the courtyard and you'll still be able to hear what's going on in here. Now, we're always delighted when newcomers join us in worship. As a newcomer, you might be interested in some of the groups and activities we offer. A good way to get this information is through an email newsletter and email news calendar. Online newcomers will receive an email invitation to join our email list after the service. In person newcomers, if you haven't already given us your email, when you sign in, please share it before you leave. Our weekly email is the best way to get information about the many groups and activities that we offer at Chalice. And now let's take a breath together.
I'm Judy Cavallo. I'm Steve Schlesinger. And we live on land stolen from, from the, the Payam Coetion, now known as San, San Marcos. Marcos. My name is Dennis Brown, and I live on land stolen from the Payam Coetion, now known as Marietta. My name is Dre Marsh, and I live on land stolen from the Kumeyaay and Payam Coetion, now known as Escondido. My name is Jeff Harley. I live on land stolen from the Payam Coetion. That area is now known as Vista. I'm Debbie Street Idell. I live on land stolen from the Kumeyaay. It's now known as Scripps Ranch. My name is Amaki Ayipa, and I live on land stolen from the Payo Quichim, now known as San Marcos. And now we light our chalice. <clears throat> which is the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. And I'd like to invite Carol Ann Lucian forward. This is her first time here. So Wait, this is her first time here in person. In person, yes. <laughs> the actual Carol Ann is here. <clears throat> our chalice lighting words come from Janet Parsons. The flame of our chalice is a symbol of the warmth and brightness of our connections. The flame lights our way back again from our separate lives, and it lights our way forward into this year of promise and renewal.
Our service this morning is about the skills of being an adult. And so yesterday I started to write a call to worship about how grown up it is on Sunday morning to attend church. But then I remembered that the compelling force that gets many people to church in person, the people who are happiest to be here are the children of the household. So this morning, let yourself be fed by the joy and delight of singing together and hearing a story and being with each other. Let's laugh together and savor this time and be grateful to have something fun to do on Sunday mornings. <laughs> Open your heart and relax your shoulders and breathe deeply. You are loved and you are whole, and you are welcome. Let us worship together. Please rise in body or spirit to join in singing. Our Sunday worship is the shared spiritual practice of our community, and we tend the congregation during this time by sharing and honoring our joys and sorrows. Here in the chapel, you're welcome to write your joy or sorrow on a candle card, which will be collected from you. Online, please write your joy or sorrow, including your name, in the chat, chat box. These joys and sorrows will be spoken out loud and then we will remove the part of the service from that recording that will go on to the YouTube channel. So this sharing won't be publicly available online. We'll have a few mu minutes of music so you can write down what you would like to share. A and if you'd like to send Reverend Sharon a confidential note about your joy or sorrow, <clears throat> or to make a prayer request, please email her. her Email address will be on the screen in a moment.
All right, uh, we light a final pillar candle for all the joys and sorrows in the room that may go unshared and unspoken this morning. These two are held in the love and support of this community. Now, this morning, we are pleased to welcome those who have chosen to become members of our congregation. The decision to become a member is an expression of spiritual commitment. Through, though your individual spiritual journeys and questioning continue, you have nevertheless come to a time in your journey where you are willing to say, yes, this is my home. And today we celebrate that homecoming. Today we will welcome five new members, uh, well, four new members and a returning member. So at this time, I would like to invite our congregation's president, Tom Carlstrom, and board member and vice president, Kate Varib, to come forward to help welcome our new members. As Chalice's president, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our congregation. Our individual journeys have brought us together in this moment and in this place to share a common purpose and a vision for our collective future. We celebrate your decision to become members of this congregation and to link your futures with ours. Through your choice to join this congregation, you have expressed your intention to adhere to our covenant, to promote our principles, and to be part of our community. Through you, our new members, the congregation is renewed. May your spirit be nurtured here as together we seek justice in the wider world. Welcome. So it is my privilege to introduce each of you as members to our congregation. We welcome and honor the diversity you bring, which increases the vitality and creativity of our community. We embrace you this day, honoring the talents and energy each one of you adds to our congregation. We encourage you to savor the journey you have begun today. Okay, so some people joined a year ago. <laughs> the, journey, the journey you're beginning today, or a year ago, or a long time ago, whenever, <laughs> but, but maybe a different part of your journey as this ceremony indicates a different, um, a special moment in, in your lives and to find a place in the congregation that is distinctively yours. So I will call the names of each member and invite you to come forward where you will sign the membership book to formalize your commitment. You will receive a gift to welcome you to the congregation and you will receive a flower. This flower symbolizes the beauty contained in each human spirit. We give uh, flowers at different sort of ceremonial rites of passage in the congregation. May you flourish and blossom as a flower within this vibrant community. So first I'll call forward Rip Penna and Tina Penna. There are also, our members are gonna stay up here for us to, to do some speaking together in a moment. Returning to membership, Stuart Holmes. and longtime friends of the congregation who joined a year ago and then I went on sabbatical and forgot all about new member ceremonies, Judy Cavallo and Steve Schlesinger.
So it's my pleasure to welcome these members into this community in this ceremonial way. Join me again in another round of applause. So I'm gonna ask the congregation, and that's all of you, uh, even if you are a first time minister, at this moment you are part of the, the gathered congregation this morning, to rise if you are able, and to share these words of welcome. It is with joy that we affirm and recognize your decision to become members of this beloved community. We pledge to support you in your search for truth, to celebrate with you in times of joy, to help you in times of trouble, and to join with you in rightful action. And now words for our, member, our new members to say together. By joining Charles Unitarian Universalist Congregation, we commit to supporting one another in our efforts to speak honestly, to act with compassion, to love without prejudice, to live with integrity, and to respond with courage to the demands of justice. We pledge to support our congregation and the association of which it is a part of we are able with our hearts, our hands, our talents, and our resources. And now all of us, in our work together across the generations, may we become a more effective instrument of service, a voice for liberation, reason, and respect, and a community in which we can honor all that life brings to us. Recognizing that we all have ministries to fulfill, we celebrate together in unity of spirit and universality of love. May it be so. Please be seated. Now I'd like to invite the children and anyone else who would like to sit on the floor to enjoy the story. Our story is called, What Do You Do With a Problem? Written by Kobe Yamada and illustrated by Mae Bessem. I don't know how it happened, but one day I had a problem. I didn't want it. I didn't ask for it. I really didn't like having a problem, but it was there. Why is it here? What does it want? What do you do with a problem? I thought. I wanted to make it go away. I shooed it. I scowled at it. I tried ignoring it, but nothing worked. I started to worry about my problem. What if it swallowed me up? What if my problem sneaks up and gets me? What if it takes away all my things? I worried a lot. I worried about what would happen. I worried about what could happen. I worried about this and I worried about that. And the more I worried, the bigger my problem became. I wished it would just disappear. I tried everything I could to hide from it. I even found ways to disguise myself but it still found me. And the more I avoided my problem, the more I saw it everywhere. I thought about it all the time. I didn't feel good at all. I couldn't take it anymore. This has to stop, I declared. Maybe I was making my problem bigger and scarier than it actually was. After all, my problem hadn't really swallowed me up or attacked me. I realized I had to face it. So even though I didn't want to, 
Even though I was really afraid, I got ready and I tackled my problem. When I got face to face with it, I discovered something. My problem wasn't what I thought it was. I discovered it had something beautiful inside. My problem held an opportunity. It was an opportunity for me to learn and to grow, to be brave, to do something. It showed me that it was so important to look closely because some opportunities only come once. So now I see problems differently. I'm not afraid of them anymore because I know their secret. Every problem has an opportunity for something good. You just have to look for it. To come forward. As the children leave for classes, we join in singing. Walk on your path with a song so sweet that everywhere you go, love all around. Walk on your path with a song so sweet that everywhere you go there is love all around. So in case you don't know, adulting is a verb. Dictionary.com tells us that adulting is an informal term to describe behavior that is seen as responsible and grown up. This behavior often involves uh, meeting the mundane demands of independent and professional living, such as paying bills and running errands. The entry notes that the term is often used by millennial aged people to self-consciously and humorously acknowledge the performance of boring tasks associated with being an adult. So use of the word became popular in 2016, and although its usage may have begun with some humor, the term seems to have identified something real and alive. The idea that adult skills and activities do not come easily or naturally. At the same time that the term became popular, a Reddit community, a social media site Reddit, a Reddit community for adulting was created as a space for those who are trying to be an adult. That community with 164,000 members exists to this day and information is shared there all the time tips on how to stock your kitchen in order to feed yourself, how to organize your living space, and how to adult when you are too depressed to function. The heart of the community is asking and responding to questions. Yesterday's questions included, I need an adult to help me understand my medical bill. How do I tell the landlord that my neighbors are smoking weed? Will a speeding ticket increase the monthly cost of my car insurance? And how do I buy a car without getting screwed over? Relatedly, there is a YouTube channel called Dad, How Do I? Question mark, that began a few years ago when a man made a video showing how to tie a tie. That video has been viewed over two million times. His other most popular videos include how to shave your face, how to fix most running toilets, how to unclog a bathtub drain, how to change a tire, and how to jumpstart a car. His YouTube channel has over 4 million followers. So there's plenty to read about how and why millennials are slower to achieve the benchmarks of adulthood, finishing school, leaving home, finding work, and so on. But that seems to me a different issue than this interest around needing information about the tasks of adulting. 
Millennials are finishing school, leaving home, and finding work later than previous generations because of dramatic changes to the economy. So that's one thing. But I think that the rise of adulting is a different thing. And I think it's this. Millennial age people have social media to ask their questions. Whereas the rest of us just had to figure these things out ourselves, work up the courage to ask a friend, or schlep ourselves down to the library to look up information in a book. The first time I made a cheesecake, back in 1993, I must have phoned my mom a dozen times. What's a springform pan? What's a bain-marie? How do I know when it's done? What are these cracks on the top? Now the internet is filled with recipes and videos and instructions that would make these calls to my mom unnecessary. I love the convenience of the internet, and I'm also not sorry I called my mom all those times. The internet is amazing at helping us figure out how to do just about everything. But there are some keys to adulting that aren't as simple and straightforward as tying a tie or making a cheesecake. So these keys are the things that we struggle with all of our lives long. So I thought I'd share some of my thoughts on them this morning. The first biggest key to adulting, in my opinion, is understanding that we do a lot of things we don't want to do because they bring about outcomes we do want to have. So again, we do things we don't want to do in order to achieve outcomes that we do want. I think about 80% of adulting tasks and activities can be understood with this key principle. Work, for example, right? <laughs> Many of us would rather watch TV all day or hang out with friends or read a great book. But we want and need to earn money to pay for our TV channels, our books, and to do the fun things we like to do with friends. So we go to work, something we don't really want to do all of the time, in order to achieve the outcome, the money, that we want to have to do the things we want to do. Of course, the biggest disaster is when we don't like the job and the money doesn't pay very well. The reward is not commensurate with the effort. So I'll talk about that uh, in just a bit. But we pay our bills to avoid late fees, having the electricity turned off, and losing our credit cards. We do the laundry to avoid wearing stained and dirty clothes. We do the dishes to keep away pests, fungus, and smells in the kitchen. When I was in my early 20s, and still very new to adulting, I remember putting dirty pans in the refrigerator because I knew I wasn't going to get to them in a while. <laughs> adulting was hard, even back then. Now, the farther away the desirable outcome is from the undesirable task that needs to be done, the harder it is to do. There's a whole host of tasks related to health, right? <laughs> Take a multivitamin, floss your teeth, get some exercise, wear sunscreen, get an annual checkup at the doctor, the dentist, and the eye doctor. It is easy even for experienced and confident adults to sometimes skip important activities because the impact of skipping them seems far off and possibly, fingers crossed, inconsequential. So there's a bit of personal gambling that goes on, right? Maybe it won't be a disaster to skip the annual physical one year. I know it's okay to skip flossing once in a while. A certain amount of adulting is rolling the dice and hoping that things will be okay. Making time for friends and family, even people who are important to us, is an area where many of us gamble, especially in these overtime, overwhelming times. We think to ourselves something like, I want the love and support of my friends and family, so what's the minimum effort I can put in and still maintain these connections? I've spoken with many of you who feel guilty about people you haven't kept in touch with as well as you might have. So this is what I mean when I say we struggle with this all of our lives. 
These aren't skills you acquire and then they become easy. Any of us here in the room at any age can tell you the story of something we're struggling with right now, something we don't really want to do for an outcome we would very much like to have. Especially coming out of the pandemic, we're still tired, still overwhelmed. And during the pandemic, we didn't always take a shower and wash our clothes right the way we used to. So now we're having to rebuild our adulting muscles that got weak. So the second key to adulting in my mind is facing your problems, not ignoring them. It's tempting to ignore problems because adult problems can be very hard to figure out. Adult problems involve choice and risk and unknowable outcomes. They don't have obvious or easy answers. So for example, a big example, it is expensive to live in California. It is expensive to live in San Diego. And for an increasing number of people, it's a huge problem. Stay or move away? Do you hunt for a job somewhere else and then move after you get a job? Or do you move first and then job hunt after you've moved? And the quality of life here is very good. I know people who have moved away and regretted it and are now jumping through hoops to try and move back here. It is easy to imagine things will be better somewhere else, but hard to know the truth of that until you move. I mentioned earlier that it's a disaster when we're doing work we don't like for an amount of money that isn't worth it. This is a huge problem to solve. We can, it's a justice issue in the big picture, but for the person living that life, they need to figure that out. They can't wait for new officials to be elected or new legislation to be passed. Do you find a more enjoyable job? Or do you find a job that pays more? Or do you try and negotiate a raise? Or do you take a second job? I don't have advice. Just the observation that problem solving as an adult is high stakes work. No advice because there's no one right answer, just a choice to make. My husband and I bought our first house in 2001 when we were 29 years old. I had been happy renting, but my husband really pushed that we needed to buy because this is the problem he wanted us to solve. If we owned our own house, we would no longer be surprised by the rent go going up. Both of us were reasonably happy at jobs that paid okay, but not a lot extra. We didn't have a lot in savings. And so controlling our housing costs was the choice we made. So at the time, the house we bought seemed hugely expensive for the neighborhood it was in. We didn't have 20% for a down payment. So in addition to the mortgage, we had a second payment for private mortgage insurance to cover the down payment that we couldn't afford, so two payments, the young couple who sold the house to us had owned it less than a year and found it too expensive to keep up with. And so they sold it and went back to renting. My family thought we were making a huge mistake. If either one of us had lost our job or had a medical emergency or really any unexpected financial expense, another big one for people is something happens to their cars, right? Anything had happened like that, we wouldn't have been able to make our two monthly mortgage related payments. Now many of you here can guess how this turns out. I won't tell you how much we paid for that house 20 years ago or what it's worth now. <laughs> I'll just say it was a good choice and a good investment. We still own that house, we rent it out, and it's part of, now it's part of our retirement plans. So full credit to my husband for identifying and solving our problem of living with volatile rent prices. So buying a home in 2001 was a risk we took. 20 years later, with the clarity of hindsight, we can see that it worked out okay, but we didn't know that in 2001. But this is why ignoring problems is almost never a good answer to a problem. When you ignore a problem, you are, by default, choosing to solve your problem by sticking with the status quo, which usually means that your problem isn't being addressed, 
and it's not going away. As an aside, I observe that the high stakes of resolving adult problems has only gone up and up in the past two decades. Too many people of all ages can't afford housing and don't have access to reliable health care. So I think we will see more and more adults combining households to share living expenses and more multi-generational families sharing living space. Younger generations need to help take care of older generations and older generations need to help take care of younger generations. I know we would all like to preserve our independence, but there is no shame in leaning on family or friends for help. So the first key to adulting is that we do things we don't want to do in order to achieve outcomes that we do want. The second key is facing problems, not ignoring them. And the third and final key is understanding that you are not the center of the universe. <laughs> I tried to find a gentler way to say it, but that's really it. <laughs> The whole progression from childhood to adolescence to adulthood is coming to understand that other people exist, that they have opinions and feelings, and that you are just one part of the interdependent web of all existence. Maturity means self-awareness combined with empathy and compassion for other people. To put it a different way, a more poetic way, the Reverend Teresa Inez, Inez Soto writes in one of her poems, you must know not that you can do whatever you want. You are not a kudzu vine eating entire hillsides for the purpose of feeding your own lush life. And to put it yet another way, nobody thinks about you as much as you do. <laughs> So these are my three keys to adulting, and I'll be interested in hearing from you what you all think the secrets to adulting are. What are the keys that have helped you navigate adulthood successfully, or the lessons you've learned uh, from bumpy times? So let me close with this thought, shared widely on social media. I don't know its origins. When you're a kid, you think coffee is the most adult drink. Then as a teenager, you think alcohol is really the cool adult drink. Then you finally become an adult and realize that all along it was water. <laughs> water is the ultimate adult drink. <laughs> Seated or standing, please raise your voices in song.
The Sunday offering is an expression of the generosity that makes our congregational life possible. As Buddhist teacher Joseph Goldstein has said, it's important to understand that generosity is a practice. It's not just a single event. It's a quality in our hearts and minds that we can develop and cultivate. Please text your donation to Chalice. And if you haven't texted a donation before, know that once you text the amount, you'll get a reply with a link to follow to enter your credit card information. If you've entered this information previously, you won't, when you've donated, you won't have to enter it again. If your Sunday donation is meant to be part of your pledge, be sure to indicate pledge in the, after the dollar amount. The phone number for text donations will be on the screen in a moment. If you pre prefer to make an in-person donation of cash or check, there are envelopes and a donation box to the left of the double doors. You can leave those donations after the service. Please give generously. Please join in dedicating our offering Oops. with words of affirmation. At Chalice View You Congregation, our, our mission is to act to promote UU principles in ourselves and in the wider world. I'd like to sing the song, The Circle Game, by Joni Mitchell, written in the late 60s. That fits the theme for today. Please join me on the chorus. Yesterday, a child came out to wander. Caught a dragon fly inside a jar. Fearful when the sky was full of thunder And tearful at the falling of a star 
And the seasons they go round and round And the painted ponies go up and down We're captive on a carousel of time We can't return, we can only look behind from where we came and go round and round and round in the circle game then the child moved ten times round the seasons skated over ten clear frozen streams words like when you're older must appease him and promises of someday make his dreams and the seasons they go round and round and the painted ponies go up and down we're captive on a carousel of time we can't return, we can only look behind from where we came and go round and round and round in the circle game. Sixteen springs and sixteen summers gone now. Cartwheels turn to car wheels through the town. And they tell him, take your time, it won't be long now Till you drag your feet to slow the circles down And the seasons, they go round and round And the painted ponies go up and down We're captive on a carousel of time we can't return, we can only look behind from where we came and go round and round and round in the circle game. So the years spin by and now the boy is twenty. Those dreams have lost some grandeur coming true. There'll be new dreams, maybe better dreams and plenty Before the last revolving year is through And the seasons, they go round and round And the painted ponies go up and down We're captive on a carousel of time we can return, we can only look behind from where we came and go round and round and round in the circle game and go round and round and round in the circle game Will you join me in the spirit of prayer? The words come from the Reverend Dr. Rebecca Edmiston Lang. Spirit within all, mysterious force giving shape to life, miraculous source and river of being, help us to know who we are, to see our place in the history of the earth and in the family of things. Help us to see that we are part of all that ever was our grandmother's prayers and our grandfather's dreamings, our mother's courage and our father's hope. In our bones lies the calcium of antediluvian creatures. In our veins courses the water of seas. We are part of all that ever was, born of this earth, riders upon a cosmic ocean. We are not separate from nature, we are nature part of that same spirit that turns scales into feathers 
and birdsong into speech. We live by the sun, we move by the stars, we eat from the earth, we drink from the rain. Great spirit of life, help us know who we are and fill us with such love for this holy creation and gratitude for this awesome gift we call living that we might claim our inheritance and live out our calling to bless the world and each other with our care. Amen. Please rise again to join in singing. from Cynthia Landrum. We leave this gathered community, but we don't leave our connection, our concerns, our cares for one another, our service to each other, to the world, and to the, our faith continues. Until we are together again, friends, be strong, be well, be loving. Love and blessings to each of you. You are invited to close our time together by singing the will. After the closing hymn, please return your seats for an announcement. We drink from the well together, cool, cool water that quenches my justice, a thirst for joy, a thirst for a love that we're all a part of. We drink from the well. We drink from the well together. Hand in hand we are standing as one, standing for justice, standing for joy. Dancing for joy, dance for a love that we're all a part of. We drink from the well, spirits renewed. We drink from the well, stand hand in hand. We drink from the well, dancing for joy. I feel my heart swell. We drink.
doing live announcement first or video first? Sorry. Okay. Uh, be aware that we're going to return to two services beginning March 19th. Why March 19th? It's the Sunday after the hideous time change. <laughs> So uh, 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock, 9 o'clock service will be live streamed. We had our online folks take a vote, and 9 o'clock is when children's religious education will happen. So if you are excited for this news, yay! yay. <laughs> if you are not excited, reflect to yourself that no one hates getting up early more than I do. <laughs> oh, maybe Tim and I are going to duke it out to see who hates it more. All right, next announcement. Today at 11.30 in the Rainbow Room, just across the patio, we will be having our second discussion of the book Mistakes and Miracles, Congregations on the Road to Multiculturalism. Today we are talking about power. Who has the power in your life and who has the power in Chalice? Who can make change? You as a sole congregant or as a team member or as a board member? What does it take to make change? It should be a very interesting conversation you do not have to have read the book or have attended the previous meeting to come. Um, two weeks ago, the people who attended got a lot out of our discussion, so I, will, I hope you will come join us today just across at 11.30 in the patio, I'm in the rainbow room. Thank you. Speaking of power, the power to heat the, the hub is on, so, <clears throat> so you can warm up in there. Uh, <clears throat> for those online, social hour will begin in a few minutes at this same Zoom link. In-person congregants are invited to enjoy the social hour on our courtyard where masks are optional. Or in the spirit of caring, you could take your refreshment to the Blue Room and have a visit with our online congregants. <clears throat> Sorry, that's the... the uh, oh. There is a visit. Get ready for an electrifying event because in just one week, the highly anticipated 2023 Chalice Auction kicks off. The countdown is on and we're pulling out all the stops to make this the most memorable auction yet. It's not too late to get in on the action. We're still accepting donations of incredible items and experiences that will make bidders hearts race head over to charityauction.bid forward slash chalice UU and click on the donate items experiences button to submit your contributions. But hurry, the deadline for uploading items is Friday, March 3rd. Okay, if you're new to the auction game, don't worry, we've got you covered. Check out our tutorial on the auction website to get up to speed and ensure you're fully prepared for the excitement that awaits. The not to be missed live auction is Saturday, March 11th. This is where the action really heats up, but space is limited. Only 75 lucky bidders will be able to experience the live auction in the chapel. You'll need to reserve your spot ASAP to secure your place at this exclusive event. But if you can't make it in person, don't worry, we've got a Zoom option too. We're limited to 25 participants on Zoom, so make sure to reserve your spot before the May 3rd deadline so we can send you a paddle. To sign up for either option, simply visit the auction website and click on the button that says sign up for live auction in person or Zoom. It's right below the logo. It's that easy. Before the auction kicks off, we'll be hosting a pre-party in the courtyard where you can enjoy delicious food and drink while socializing with other bidders. At 5.45 p.m., we're having a bidding practice session for Zoom attendees, so you can perfect your strategy before the real fun begins at 6 p.m. And of course, we'll be taking a mid-auction break to have a costume contest and to give y'all a chance to refuel. But wait, there's more. For just $20, you and a friend can win tickets to a fabulous Chalice auction dinner party. Purchase your dinner for two opportunity drawing ticket now and let us know before the start of the live auction which dinner you would like to attend if you're the lucky winner. 
trust us, the dinners on offer are truly exceptional, and we're hoping to add even more by the March 3rd deadline. And finally, we're calling on everyone who attends the live auction to help make it a success by bringing finger foods. Please contact Hope Campbell, who is coordinating this, or another member of the auction team to sign up. This is Alec and Kathy and the famous Mojigangas of San Miguel de Allende. If this has piqued your interest, check us out in the auction catalog. The 2023 Chalice Auction is going to be the highlight of the year, so don't miss out on the fun. See you there. Coffee and refreshments are waiting for you on the far side of the courtyard. Go get warm.